what I wanted to talk about is um, social cognitive neuroscience. Why am I asking about you know, a painful life event and, and, and very deliberate words. Um, and this is Matthew Lieberman's book, Social. Please get it. Um, I highly recommend it. So what, what did, there are three main lessons from this book, if you're, if you're too busy to read it. Um, number one, the, every one of us has what Matthew calls a Trojan horse in the brain. And uh, the Trojan war was the Greeks had uh, the city of Troy uh, surrounded for 10 years. It was a 10 year siege. And eventually the Greeks kind of gave up, thought this is too hard. And then they left the Trojans uh, present, which was a massive wooden horse. The Greeks sailed away and uh, the Trojans uh, were great. And they pulled this horse into the citadel and overnight they went to sleep after a big party. But inside this wooden horse were a whole bunch of Greek soldiers who cl climbed out of the inside of the horse, opened the gates, and the, the, the story ends there. You know, the, the Trojans lost the war. Now, in neuroscientific um, world, the Trojan horse is there is a part of our brain that unconsciously takes on the beliefs and the behaviors of others, right? It's really important. So there's a part of our brain that takes on the unconscious beliefs and behaviors of others. Now, if anyone has teenage kids, um, this will kind of be of interest to you. So in the adult brain, we do have a little bit of a filter mechanism at the front of that Trojan horse, a sort of a BS um, monitor. And that helps us sort of, you know, uh, weed out the nonsense from the good stuff. But still, we do still bring stuff on unconsciously. Now, teenagers do not have that filter. That's why they can go from perfectly great kids to complete mobbits in, in a sort of blink of an eye because they take on the beliefs and the behaviors of their mates, but they think they're their own and they think they're absolutely true. So I just thought I would share that with you. Okay, so we've got a Trojan horse part to our brain. Now, secondly, the default network. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. You should be able to see me. Um, and I'm gonna show you this default network because this is also very important. And hello to everyone who's still joining us. So this is the default network in glorious Technicolor. I'll just turn that around slightly. So we've got a general cognition at the top, social cognition at the bottom. And what does that mean? Well, what they found, what Matthew and his colleagues have found, is that when we're on, focused on a task of some sort, then our general cognition is switched on, our social cognition is dimmed. Okay, it's not quite switched off, it's sort of dimmed. But conversely, when we're not focused on a task, what happens is our social cognition switches on. This sort of default network. A default network. What Matthew really is talking about is this is part of the brain. It's a bit like software running in the back of all of our computers suddenly switches on, which is kind of, you know, baffling to a degree and Matthew is intrigued by this why does this default network switch on and I'm going to come to the answer so this happens for all of us when we're not focused on a sort of a, a general a cognitive task um, the social default network turns on the third thing loss I asked earlier about um, a, a, a memory that is painful. Painful was the word I used. So Matthew did an experiment using a tool called Cyberball, which is a game, a virtual game. So I'm playing with um, two other people, but I'm sitting in an fMRI scanner, and I'm virtually passing a ball to two other people. And we were just randomly passing the ball. Now, the people in the fMRI scanner are told that the experiment was to do with hand-eye coordination or coordination on a kind of simulation. And within about three or four minutes of playing this game, suddenly, these two people aren't passing the ball to me anymore. They're passing just to each other. I've been cut out of the game. And a part of the brain lights up at that point. And what they found was the part of the brain that lit up was the same part of the brain that feels pain. 
So, sorry, same part of the brain that lights up when we feel pain. I need to be very clear with my language. This was a really, really big deal when this was discovered. And what they did is they brought the people out of the fMRI scanner and said, look, um, you weren't really cut out of the game by two strangers. Uh, it's just a, a program. It's just a piece of software and it randomly cuts you out of the game. And you went, okay, now I understand. I don't feel so bad. And they put the person back in the FM, fMRI scanner. And even though they knew it was just a piece of software running, when they got cut out of the game, the pain network fired up again, even though they knew it was just a simulation and it was just a random piece of software. So this is really important. This sense of social loss triggered the pain sender. Equally, when we're included in something, it triggers the reward sender. Now, what's the point of all of that? The main point I'm trying to make is that um, when Maslow created this hierarchy of need where he said our physiological needs, food and water, our needs for safety and shelter and then love and belonging, that was the hierarchy. And on a, a sort of normal common sense perspective, yes, that's correct. But what we find in from neuroscience is that it's not accurate. And what we mean by that is our social connection, that love belonging piece is actually at the bottom of the pyramid. It is the primary need. It's a survival need because as infants, we are dependent on a social connection for our survival. What these experiments, these three pieces show us is that the brain is geared for social connection because it is so profoundly important to survival. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, the brain treats many social threats and rewards with the same intensity as physical threats and rewards. Okay, that's the big piece from this section. So our capacity to, to make decisions, solve problems, collaborate with others is generally reduced by the threat response and increased by the reward response.